a team of mercenaries is determined to improve themselves while they look for love in a year in which they keep a personal diary. Somebody write this. Hi, and welcome to Somebody Write This, where we use a random plot generator to give us an idea, and then we brainstorm how it could be a thing somebody might want to write. I'm Hannah. And I'm Jenny. And to help us with our brainstorming today, we have a guest. Welcome, Presley Thomas. Hello. Hello. Hi. Presley, we're so excited to have you on the podcast. You've done some writing yourself. We we talked a little bit beforehand about this uh, the story that you had that you had written and that was out for publication. Tell us a little bit about the story, and we'll get into a little uh, some of the details around it. Uh, yeah, this story is called uh, "The Explorer." It uh, looks at a a college student who's trying to escape his family, who's going through um, a bit of a, a bit of a marriage trouble. So he goes to work on a farm during the summer. It's sort of inspired by like Flannery O'Connor and her Southern Gothic tales. And then with a, like a little twist, that's a little more like Carmaria Machado maybe. And I actually wrote it eight years ago. So I've been mostly revising during these pandemic times. And it's interesting to see, I guess, how different I am now to how I wrote then and what was on my mind. Yeah, this story, it just really, it, it changed my life, even though it hasn't, like, been published. It's been a, a way to kind of connect with people, and actually, my first landlord read this story, and she's, and that's how I met her. <laughs> so, I ended up moving into her apartment and all this weird stuff. So, it's been, it's been a good story. I just hope it gets a nice home wherever it ends up. I love the idea of, yeah, this story continuing to make connections for you and be a, a connector to other people. Yeah, I'd love for you to to chat a little bit more about, you know, looking back on this story and being a very different person now than you were then. Are there pieces of it that as you look back through it and do revisions that, w- which pieces of that stand in, in, I guess, the starkest contrast for you? Which pieces of it look do you look back on and go, oh, wow, I don't think I would have ever written that or thought that now if I was writing it now I think it really most most of it looking back was really making sure that looking at the characters and thinking about is this character too hard or too sharp is that really growth or is it more that letting them interact and and like either change or not change but not seeing them as like only one form or one shape but having more of a human element I think I really tended to view people more as I was writing as, oh, they're just this one thing and they're going to react this way and that kind of thing. But, it, but looking at revising and softening the characters some and giving them, giving them human elements too, even though they're just words on a page was kind of a new thing. I'm curious as you continue to, you know, you're revising now, but there's other stuff that you've been, that you just worked on and written. I'm curious, do you feel like you have a different goal, maybe it's not the right word, but a different end point in mind for your writing now than you would have then? Different, what are some different things that you're wanting to say or explore with your writing now that, uh, that wouldn't have crossed your mind back then? Well, it's not true for this story. But sexuality isn't a concern in this story, but I'm very um, interested moving forward and making my work gayer and greater, as I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> And I was not inhabiting that fully at the time, but I knew that about myself. And so being willing to project that into my writing and build relatable characters and worlds for them is new for me. And it's something I've been doing uh, in other spaces. How do you think that the changing of uh, or revealing of your character and your person and your identity, how do you think that that changes how you either, uh, either write or read? Um, I think one of the big things in queer stories that I read and that I try to write is like there's a lot more room for what we call camp. So like if something happens and it's a little over the top, if it's a queer writer and it's a queer story, i am be like, that's camp. That's great. Keep it. Whereas I think maybe a straight uh, person reading it or someone not familiar with queer culture might say, oh, that's over the top. You should edit that. And I'm just like, no, keep it. Um, I mean, I think the best example we can see of that in popular culture would probably be drag queens and drag shows. 
so you so you see like the performer they've got all this makeup on it's kind of wild and i like to see that i like to see that element in queer art as well um you know maybe not as much makeup but other elements of like the fantastic or or making or even just making room for new and different things that maybe don't make sense at first but are part of the world kind of like exploration through exaggeration yeah i mean because part of what i do too is i'll review queer ya for another publication and i'll read the i'll read the other reviews for some of the stuff and they're like yeah they'll probably edit that out i'm like no this is culture this is this is important Mm. Uh, but other reviewers don't really see that maybe presley thank you so much i'm 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 glad that you got to share a little bit of that uh of that revising thought process i think that's a really interesting thing um we are going to scoot on into our brainstorming and uh, talk through this and see if we can come up with something that works with this so as a reminder our plot is a team of mercenaries is determined to improve themselves while they look for love in a year in which they keep a personal diary well, so to start off, you know, looking for love in a year when you keep in a personal diary—that's that's a that's a trope that's been used several times, and that's a that's a structure that we're, f- we're familiar with. So the part that I'm curious about is the team of mercenaries. Yeah, I think I know in my uh, in my family the relationship writer says I need to see all Marvel and DC comic and superhero movies. So I think <laughs> uh-huh. a, I think a lot of my thought is going kind of towards like the Suicide Squad movie. Mm. And, you know, maybe, but maybe instead of, instead of them pushing against the police or whatever with like bomb collars, it would be more like a suicide squad, like Professor X mashup, where there's Mm -hmm. like this moral ethical leader who's like, you'll have skills, but you'll need to hone them and uh-huh. write this diary and fall in love it'll make you a better person i don't know <laughs> no that's the the thing that's getting to me is that this isn't just one mercenary doing this like having this personal goal it's that a whole group of mercenaries and it's unusual exactly. enough to have one mercenary keeping a diary to find love <laughs> bridget jones style but for a whole team of doing it and i like that idea right. that it is like it is like a group of people who uh who yeah or maybe maybe and- have some sort of person guiding them through their self-improvement journey <laughs> and, and, and and the idea that it's it's a singular diary they're not yeah, all I'm, keeping different diaries they're keeping one diary together i was curious about that too i was trying to figure <laughs> out what this was like a sisterhood of the traveling pants kind of thing i think they all shared a diary <laughs> where they passed it back and forth between themselves and i'm trying to figure um, out if if that a personal diary means it has to be just one diary, or if we can say that they're each keeping their own. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think either one is intriguing to me. How mercenarying are they still being? Does their self improvement mm. lead them away from that, or does it make them better at it? Well, may- yeah, maybe but- they're in one of like the uh, maybe they're in one of those like dystopian worlds where like mercenarying is like a marketable skill so it's not like terrible terrible it's like chaotic good maybe okay and so but part of the part of the building the world back up into a functioning society is to make connections with other people and um and build humanity but like they have to learn how to do that for themselves before they teach it to other people or something yeah they're like the new adam and eve or something (laughs) that are like bringing yeah i'm liking the flavor of this i'm liking the flavor this is nice well i'm wondering as well if this is maybe you know you look at this dystopian world everything's a little chaotic maybe the mercenaries have been essentially the the ones kind of holding things together (laughs) by any means necessary and maybe they're moving toward a world in which they are no longer needed and maybe that hasn't happened yet but they like either they are part of it and part of like we're going to make this world better so that we don't have to do this anymore (laughs) or they know that the change is coming and so they're all going what are we going to do when the the skill that we have built our lives on is no longer reputable or sustainable and we have to find new things to do yeah and maybe and maybe as the you know the story progresses it starts out very mercenary but part of the art is their actions become less violent and more more loving or more caring and so part of that arc could be that change and maybe Mm -hmm. not all of them make it 
or maybe yeah maybe they're running into different things and and growing and changing in different ways trying to figure out their paths forward oh my heart's already hurting just at the potential (laughs) (laughs) well because you all you know if you're writing a series you need to have like a new bad guy by the end of the first book right so yeah so this could be like you know a trilogy and be like oh, by the end, we have someone we thought was good who was, like, the new bad guy, and how is it going to unfold, and so forth. Oh, like, what if what if one of the team ends up being the bad yeah. guy because they were looking for love and didn't find it, or got, like, rejected yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you could really, you could lean into some interesting stuff there looking at, looking at the concept of feeling like you're owed or, or entitled to love, and if you don't get it, feeling like that's... Uh, that's mm. the rest of the world's fault and that they owe you stuff. And that could be a really interesting angle to take that character that that, that rejection fuels his darker side <laughs> instead of encouraging yeah. him to strengthen himself up and move forward. Yeah, and that's a real hu- and that's a real human feeling too. Like oh, yeah. you may want a relationship, but there's no guarantee. And then when you think about the spectrum of sexuality too. They yeah. could be mm-hmm. straight, they could be gay, they could be bi, they could be things related to gender. So uh, having a whole team of mercenaries really gives you opportunities to explore different elements. Absolutely. Definitely. I- I'd be intrigued to have, you could have an asexual character who and, and, and aromantic who oh, yeah. is doing this because they feel like they're supposed to and only to find out that that's not really what is going to fulfill them. Um, yeah, or, really or that their love or that their love looks different than other people. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Or or they discover what that looks like in the process. Especially um, in a dystopian, say, future, I'm, yeah. I'm assuming is what we're looking at here, when when possibly population is an issue, you know, and yeah. if you're asexual, like, what's your role in that? When it, when it, mm-hmm. when it actually is the, the continuation of the species is in question. Part of the attraction, attraction for a lot of people in any relationship, whether it's friendship, mm-hmm. romantic, or whatever, is care for others. Mm-hmm. So, yes, finding those roles and exploring those roles, yeah, that's mm-hmm. worth doing. That that's one of the things that I, I, my my roommate and I have been watching. I've been introducing her to different TV shows. She's very drawn naturally to realistic fiction, so she likes the crime shows and that kind of stuff. But something I've been explaining to her and that I love about stories is using non realistic fiction to explore our humanity. And I think that's what the, mm. what this story is doing. Let's find a different setting, different circumstances, but explore stuff that we're dealing with now. Like yeah. like sexuality and relationships and the, the normal everyday human stuff. Well, and the beauty of a dystopian model is you don't have the luxury of ignoring people because yes. yeah. a lot of times you've just got a handful of folk and you've got to make it work. Yeah, exactly. you can't you can't lose one of them. You can't discount one of them. Everybody right. has to be part of this, or we all go down. <laughs> Which we're learning today in America. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is this is an important thing to consider now. Yes. I'm curious. So, is this told in diary entries? See, see, I was wondering about the form of the diary, and I was thinking if if technology is still a thing in this dystopian future, is it like a shared blog or something? where like everybody can read the entries of this group of people or is it a more personal thing like like a book they actually pass around i think the format is important here what do you think i think dystopian i think less technology for some reason yeah, that's true um, i know Kurt Vonnegut had this novel called i think it's called hocus pocus or something and the premise of the novel is it was written on scraps of paper he found while he was walking to and from campus where he worked. And so the novel had like, was sectioned off in places because the assumption was it was pieces of paper. And I wonder too about non-traditional forms of journaling. So you've got, you know, you've got paragraphs too, you've got, but you've also got people that bullet journal. You've got people who maybe they use sketches and things in their journaling. Oh, yes. Um, So there are ways that, you know, that can be made more interesting, but maybe, maybe one way to shore up the structure is to have the notes of like the leader who is like helping them find their relational counterpoints or whatever, 
would be part of it as well. So maybe mm-hmm. his patient notes or something. So we've gone back and forth on whether this is one journal they're all keeping together or whether it's individual. Uh-huh. I worry if it's one journal they're all keeping together, we're not going to get any moments where it's clear that characters are breaking away from them or That's anything true. that they didn't feel. So what if it's both? What if this this journey partly requires them to keep, uh, to together come up with a, keep a log in a sense, where they gather together, they write down what they've learned, what they've been working on, but that's also inter- interspersed with their own personal entries. And so that could get really interesting because you could have these characters who you realize are going through something really big or making big shifts in their thinking and then seeing what they put in the public one that everybody yes. can see and how that's very different. Um, I love Presley's idea of using different formats. That's a way that we could really distinguish the characters from each other and make it much more interesting to read. So yeah, if you do have bullet journaling or you have somebody who sketches and captions, <laughs> like oh his journals gosh. are just like, an image and then a phrase underneath it um you could do some really interesting things with oh, that i can't i i want to read this <laughs> right I, oh my um, gosh okay so we do have a title i'm gonna give you the title our title for this is meet the crew ha <laughs> <laughs> perfect like here they are <laughs> um which I think works really well because we are, this is very much a, a character centered narrative. I think it's about all these different characters who are all part of the same crew, all learning about self-improvement and love in yeah. some way, shape or form, both as individuals and as a unit. Um, so I kind of really like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who any of these characters are yet, but I, I'm in love with them already just because they're yeah. human. You know, that title sets up our origin story for sure. This is at least a trilogy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. How many mercenaries do you think we're following? Like, if we're, especially if we're getting bits of individual people's journals as well. Like, for, how for many do you think at least the core group, even if maybe some come in for a little while and leave later. Yeah. How big is our crew? Yeah, it could be too big unless you want, like, a really big book or story. Want a tight knit think- group like maybe like the crew of the Serenity maybe? Yeah, I would say yeah. maybe like four top, plus mm-hmm. your like facilitator. You could if you have a trilogy, you could also have people drop in and out. Like if you do have somebody who becomes uh, who who does spin off and decide to go in a different route morally, uh, you could definitely yeah. have them stop not show up in book two and not be invited back to be part of this <laughs> uh, and replace them with and replace them with somebody else. So you could slowly fold in other characters and bring out ones. I would yeah, I was thinking four to six. Uh, and maybe maybe over the whole trilogy you could have like seven or eight who dipped in and out at different times. But I think yeah, four or five at the most actively involved at a time. Yeah, for sure. I want to know more about this facilitator in a dystopian yeah. world. Who is this person and how did he and the crew, he or she and the crew get together to, were they looking for therapy or did the facilitator approach them? Or maybe we finally abolished prison. And so the actual um, treatment was actually more human. Oh, oh interesting. But- Okay. But also, like, you don't, it's harder to tell when you're ready to go out into the world because it's not like, oh, you're in here for this many years. It's like you're in here until you meet this treatment goal or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. So what if this group, this particular group, the facilitator maybe isn't even part of the crew at first. He is the, like, the counselor, the therapist, or the doctor in charge of their treatment. What if they right. were all involved in the same, they knew each other beforehand, and they were all involved in something that, some some big operation that was both illegal and harmful, and Ooh. as well as well, personally harmful. So, like, they've got, they're, they're working through their own, uh, you know, their trauma through that, as well as, I like the idea that it was, that it is a, a, a prison replacement, that it is them, people trying to make sure that they're ready to go back out into the world and be safe, uh, and be safe for others. Or, I have an alternate idea. Yeah. For this, uh, b- based on what Presley said earlier, about the, maybe they weren't needed anymore as mercenaries. So what if this world is actually on the cusp of being post-dystopian? Mm-hmm. And so their function in society is no longer needed anymore, but they're still people. And like, so this is part of their their recovery from being mercenaries to integrate into the new enlightened society. Oh, okay. So 
I let so both of them. What if they both are of them. okay? They yeah. So what if they were mercenaries? They were involved in something that got them sent to regular prison. <laughs> so they were just locked up, and uh-huh. while they were in there, <laughs> things changed. Regime regimes changed, procedures changed, and they are now being given this opportunity to instead work toward work in treatment toward self-improvement toward toward healing toward recovery and uh so you could have a whole bunch of them who are like this is who who are really resistant and they're like this is the dumbest thing i've ever heard of why is that why am i being asked (laughs) to keep a diary this is stupid um as well as some who are like hey i'll do whatever it takes if it means i can get out of here and so you could have these different responses to the diary to begin with which could be really interesting to explore and and look at how their their views of of how things were, how things were, and how things are, and so not only not only improving themselves, but improving themselves to function in this new world, <laughs> could be really interesting. I'm trying to. Think, it reminds me. It reminds me of something, and I can't remember what it is, and it's bothering me. Oh, <laughs> just trying to remember um, that story. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like the idea of kind of being able to track the change. So maybe they start one way, and go yeah. another way. And I think the journal would do that, or the diary would do that. What if some poor mercenary was misunderstood what the word diary meant and just started writing about the people he had killed as a mercenary? Oh, oh no! <laughs> like a past journal. Like, no, I feel like you could be, reveal oh. so much about these characters through their through their mandated diary entries, and especially well, yeah. their mandated I- diary entries for themselves, as opposed to what they shared with the group. Like that dynamic really fascinates me. The, the, there's the personal and there's the public. And how do those sync up and how do those diverge from each other? And some could sync up more over the course of the, course of the trilogy and some could yeah. diverge further. Not, not only what they say, but how they say it and when. And they could be getting, re- I guess, released in a sense at various points throughout this trilogy <laughs> and let back into the world. And maybe we still get to see yeah. their, their personal diaries, but they're no longer uh, in a sense accountable to the rest of the group and sharing what's going on there. And so you could have them, you know, how does what they did in during their treatment affect them when they step out back into the world, trying to continue looking for love and oh whatever gosh. that means for them. I think I yeah. want to write this. <laughs> Well, and even in even if you're in a rehabilitation program, there is like some method of work release too. So yeah. maybe maybe yeah. instead of like breaking rocks and with chains on, it's like go on a date with this woman we chose for right. you. <laughs> <laughs> Court mandated dating. Yes, my problem is solved. <laughs> Like Saturday that night is be... taken care of. Like now, I want to know about the about the people who agree to go on those dates with them. Yeah, <laughs> like because like, like, that's the other half of the story. Like, if if they're improving themselves and trying to find love, the stories of the people they they encounter are also important. So yeah, it's, who are who are these people? It's probably one of those dating apps like experiments where they're like, we'll pair these yes. daters with inmates for you if you pay <laughs> us, like. Yeah, xconmatch.com exactly <laughs> that'd be fascinating we are right around at at time where we have to wrap this up but i love this story I like do too. so much oh my gosh um, a lot of our stories have this sort of um a wackiness to them which i really love but i like that this one feels very centered in people and personal yes. experiences and even though it is in this dystopian or alternative history world it feels very of now which I really yes. love. And like yeah. I wanna I want to write these characters and I want to get to know these I, characters. <laughs> I know. Collaborative okay. nano this year, Hannah? Yes. Yes. You and me? Get a whole bunch it. of people together to do National Novel <laughs> Writing Month. We're each taking a character. Yes. Write some, write some diary <laughs> entries. Oh, I love this. Okay. Okay, cool. As we close things out before we do that, uh, let's go ahead and we'll each take a second and shout out a story that we would like to recommend to our listeners. Mine today, actually, I'm going to keep with the the diary theme. I have just finished reading The Memory Book by Laura Avery, which is a young adult uh, novel told through the, the journal of a young girl who is uh, diagnosed with a disease that essentially is, is it's, it's going to, 
very quickly bring on dementia and the inability to take care of herself entirely. And it's her wrestling with that and fighting with it and figuring out how can I still do everything. At the beginning, she's very like, I'm I'm still going to go to college in New York. I'm going to make this happen. I'm going to move away from my family. And it's her figuring out what she can and cannot do and and trying to connect with her family and her friends around her and trying to just live a normal life while knowing that she also realistically only has a, a couple years left. Um, it's a really engaging story and I really love the characters in it. She feels very, very real to me. And the use of the diary, she starts keeping it specifically so that she can hold on to her memories because she knows she's going to lose them. And it's a really beautifully written book. I really enjoyed it and uh, would definitely recommend uh, anybody else to check that out who might be interested going to toss it to Jenny. What story would you like to recommend for our listeners today? The story I'm going to recommend today is a game series called Daymare Town by Matosh Skutnik. He's known for his highly artistic, slightly creepy Flash games mostly. I don't know if Flash isn't a thing, but they've all been um, remastered. Daymare Town in particularly, it's all drawn in black and white. You're in this what looks like an abandoned city, but every once in a while you'll catch a citizen hiding around the corner or a pair of eyes looking at you from the darkness. And most of the story element is kind of implied and inferred from the surroundings and what you're trying to do. But it's a really fascinating little point and click game uh, that if you're into those at all, I would highly recommend because it's just beautiful. All right, Presley, if you could recommend a story in any medium at all to our listeners, what would you like to recommend? Oh, um, oh, it's summer. Um, I'm in Houston, so I'm going to represent my hometown uh, with this queer YA book that I reviewed a few months ago mm-hmm. called um, The Gravity of Us by Phil Stamper. It is set in a suburb of Houston where NASA is at. And, you know, you know, Houston, we have a problem, all that kind of stuff. It's a young teen who moves to Houston with his dad, who becomes an astronaut. And the town is actually, the way they fund these missions is through a space reality TV program where they follow the astronauts and their families around with cameras and create Ooh. government interest in uh, exploring space. And while he's there, he falls in love with one of the astronaut sons and Aww. slowly builds his uh, social media platform, moved it from New York to Houston and becomes like a big deal and makes, holds NASA accountable and, and some of these hmm. other crazy groups that are trying to take advantage of these astronauts and also falls in love at the same time. It's really good. All right. Before we take off, Presley, is there anything you'd like to plug for yourself? Any current projects or uh, social media? Anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, I write reviews for Interstellar Flight Magazine. They're on Medium. I write on Medium as well. And I'm on Twitter at Writer Thoughts. So you can find all my stuff there. We'll make sure and include those links in the show description as well so that uh, y'all can follow Presley and see what he's up to these days and what he's writing. Fantastic. Thank you once again so much for coming on the show. We, I'm really happy that we, that we got you on and that you helped us flesh out this really beautiful story. Seriously. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is my first podcast. I'm excited. Nice. Oh, I'm sweet. glad that we could. Hopefully it was a good introduction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, that is our episode. As a reminder, you can find us every other Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at WriteThisPod. And if you've been inspired by this episode and have questions or comments or a story or anything else, email us at somebodywritethis at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We'll be back with another episode in two weeks. We'll see you then. And as they say, if the beginning is good, the end must be perfect. (music) 